to the responsibility to protect. From atrocity prevention. Word kill. All societies are potentially vulnerable. Atrocity crimes. Timely and appropriate action. Welcome to Expert Voices on Atrocity Prevention, a podcast by the Global Center for the Responsibility to Protect. I'm Jacqueline Streifeld Hall, Research Director at the Global Center. Over the last year, we have had multiple conversations and public events around what it means to prevent and respond to atrocities at a granular level. These conversations have ranged from discussing the relationship between R2P and human rights violations, to situating atrocity prevention within the Women, Peace, and Security agenda, and to understanding the preventive and restorative aspects of pursuing investigations, justice, and accountability. To explore these dynamics further, this podcast will feature one-on-one conversations with practitioners from the field of human rights, conflict prevention, atrocity prevention, and other related agendas. These conversations will give us a glimpse of the personal and professional side of how practitioners approach human rights protection and atrocity prevention. We hope that through these conversations, we can explore challenges, identify best practices, and share lessons learned on how we can protect populations more effectively. Today, we will be speaking with Radia Al-Mutawakil from Mwantana Organization for Human Rights about the conflict in Yemen. Before we get started with Radia's interview, I sat down with the Global Center's Yemen expert, Jahan Pitalwala, to discuss the situation in Yemen. Jahan, six years have passed since the war in Yemen dramatically escalated. In that time, we've seen evidence of rampant atrocity crimes, and the situation has generated the world's worst humanitarian crisis. How did the country end up here? Thanks for that question, Jackie. Um, The the war in Yemen, as you mentioned, has been raging for over six years since the Houthis seized Sana'a and President Hadi fled the capital. And then this was followed by an intervention of a coalition of Arab states, which is led by Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. And since then, the war in Yemen has primarily been waged through violations of international law that actually amount to war crimes and crimes against humanity. The Saudi and UAE-led coalition in 2015 had launched a brutal air war campaign, and it's backed by countries like the United States, the United Kingdom, and France. And those indiscriminate airstrikes since its launch in 2015 have killed or maimed over 18,000 civilians. And there's also been accompanying on the ground violent hostilities, which in turn have been accompanied by a wide ranging assault on civilians and on human rights in Yemen by by all parties to the conflict. Civilians have been killed, wounded, arbitrarily detained, disappeared and tortured. Warring parties obstruct humanitarian aid. They recruit and use children in hostilities. They occupy schools and hospitals illegally, and they attack healthcare and humanitarian workers. This is a wide range of atrocity crimes and violations of international law that are being consistently perpetrated in Yemen. And these crimes, for which there's been almost total impunity and no accountability, have cumulatively caused the deaths of more than over 13,000 civilians and displaced more than 4 million Yemenis. And these crimes have also inflicted, as you mentioned, the world's worst humanitarian crisis, and it's entirely man-made. 20 million Yemenis are in need of dire humanitarian assistance. That's over 80% of the population. So the situation in Yemen is extremely dire, multifaceted, and and consistently inflicting threats uh, upon civilians there. Thanks, Jahan. And I know that the situation in Yemen has really sort of dropped off the radar in terms of international media, um, international attention within places like the Security Council. And so is it is it a question of it's a humanitarian problem now and the war is waning or um, are other things at work now? So what what is happening in the conflict today? So to put it quite Frankly, the situation in Yemen has not really improved at all. There are 49 active front lines across the country and civilians are still facing daily atrocity risks. And the conflict has really devolved since its escalation in 2015. There's the internationalized level in which the Saudi UAE led coalition backing President Hadi's government is fighting the Houthis. And then there are multiple intra-Yemeni conflicts uh, 
on the ground that are occurring where the Houthis are fighting the Southern Transitional Council and the Southern Transitional Council is also fighting the Hadi government. So it's really complex and it's continued to be complex over the years. There are flare ups in Hodeida and Taiz and Haja governance, plus a new Houthi offensive in Marib which is leading to increased mass displacement, more civilian casualties, and continued illegal attacks on civilian objects like homes and farms and displacement camps. So the situation is extremely worrying and there really isn't an end in sight because the Houthis seem to be advancing really rapidly on Marib and there's not a lot of momentum coming from the international community. Speaking of the lack of momentum by the international community, You know, despite the crimes you've mentioned here, action on Yemen remains painfully slow. Uh, There are at least two UN bodies documenting evidence of crimes. There's been a UN envoy to Yemen since 2012, and the current and former heads of OCHA have been extremely vocal about the humanitarian consequences of the fighting. Amidst all of these mechanisms raising alarm bells, plus the efforts of civil society organizations like our own and Mawatana, which we'll be talking to today, why do you think international attention on Yemen has continued to wane? I think in in these types of protracted conflicts, there, there usually are two primary reasons why international attention is limited. And I think Yemen is a really strong case in point. So firstly, there's complacency of the UN Security Council. When the Security Council first engaged on the conflict in Yemen, the dynamics of the conflict were drastically different, and they haven't really updated their framing of the conflict with a new resolution in over six years. And so therefore, they're sort of presenting a really inaccurate picture of the fractious multi-front conflict that's unfolding on the ground. Simultaneously, the UN Security Council doesn't really react with an even hand to the atrocity crimes that are being perpetrated in Yemen. There are basically little to no repercussions for the Saudi UAE-led coalition and the indiscriminate airstrikes that they have been conducting in Yemen. Three permanent members of the Security Council have been complicit in the coalition's crimes, and perhaps this is why there hasn't really been an even hand coming from the council. And as an extension of that, the council hasn't really engaged on the human rights dimensions of this conflict whatsoever, which has almost given a free pass to to perpetrators and to warring parties to continue their uh, likely atrocity crimes and violations of international law. And secondly, and I think this point is actually really connected to the complacency of the Security Council, is that in Yemen, there's been pervasive impunity for violations of international law. As you mentioned, yes, there is a group of eminent experts monitoring ongoing violations in Yemen. Yes, there is a limited UN Security Council sanctions regime. Yes, there is a UN special envoy. But there hasn't been consistent, principled intolerance from high levels of the international community for the atrocities that have been perpetrated against Yemenis. When there's no consistent outrage or consistent accountability for crimes, they sort of become the status quo And this is exactly what has happened in Yemen. Thanks, Jahan. I'm I'm glad you mentioned the lack of consistency in intolerance and and rage, both by the Security Council, as well as um, high levels of the international community, and the the lack of even-handedness. Because I know with Yemen in particular, one issue that has been, you know, very much at the forefront has is the you know listing and delisting of perpetrators of crimes against children in this conflict. Um, some years the Saudi coalition is listed, some years they're not, and they've very much been a perpetrator of crimes against children throughout the conflict. Given the lack of consistency in international response, what do you think it would take to prompt real a- action for this crisis? You know, galvanizing real action by the international community is extremely challenging, not just in the situation of Yemen, but across the board. You're essentially relying on principled states to make the right choice. And I think the unique geopolitics surrounding the situation in Yemen, the complicity of numerous powerful states in the atrocity crimes that have been ongoing there, and the complacency of the UN Security Council, like I mentioned before, all make real action all the more difficult 
in the context of Yemen. So what it would take is something actually really dramatic. I think that the Security Council would have to suddenly wake up, pass a new resolution that accurately reflects the dynamics of the conflict on the ground, adopt more even-handed sanctions against all perpetrators of violations, and place human rights and the protection of Yemeni civilians at the center of the UN Special Envoy's efforts. But to be honest, I think this is extremely unlikely, at least in the short term. So I think what we can do, what, what we must do in the interim is to continue to raise the bar. That means reminding the international community and third party states that they are ultimately failing to uphold their responsibility to protect and remind them of the consequences of this inaction. So civil society organizations like, like ourselves at the Global Center, like Muatana, like other Yemeni and international partners should and will continue to exert consistent pressure towards the UN Security Council and the UN Special Envoy to do more to halt impunity, towards parties to the conflict to actively protect civilians, and towards the international community at large to alleviate and ultimately end the humanitarian suffering in Yemen. We do our best and we work our hardest towards these ends. And ultimately, we just hope that states are listening and will eventually uphold their moral and legal obligations. Our guest today is Radia Alwutawaka, the chairperson and co-founder of Muwatana Organization for Human Rights. Radia was on Time Magazine's list of 100 Most Influential People of 2019, and last year received the Anna Politkovskaya Award for her courage and determination in documenting and reporting on the human cost of war in Yemen. Her organization, Muatana, has documented war crimes and human rights abuses perpetrated against civilians in Yemen throughout the conflict, and was recently nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize. Thank you for joining us today, Radia. Thank you for having me. I'm glad to be with you. Radia, you're celebrated globally for your dedicated work on documenting international law violations throughout the war in Yemen. Can you share a little with us about what drew you to this line of work and your personal history? Uh, you know, Jacqueline, when I started uh, as individual to work in human rights, I started in 2004. I started like doing like advocacy and pressure. So the documentation was not in my mind. And then me and my partner, Abdul Rashid, that we have founded Muadana together. We have worked with international NGOs like Human Rights Watch, Amnesty, Open Society Foundation. And we started to realize that uh, uh, what does documentation mean? What does having the information, the power of having information as a first step towards any uh, work in human rights? So when we started to build Muadana, we decided that documentation should be uh, one of our, our main uh, work in Muwatana. Uh, so uh, because we believe that the information is a power and we believe that we have the responsibility to build a human rights memory. Can you elaborate a little on how Muwatana approaches this documentation at work? And how does your analysis and reporting enhance the information collection being done by the UN's group of eminent experts and others operating at the international level? Uh, Muatana is a team of 100 men and women. Uh, one of the biggest units in Muatana is the research unit. We have field researchers uh, all over Yemen, uh, and we follow an investigative research methodology. So in Muatana, if we say that we have documented this incident, it means that we have conducted interviews with eyewitnesses, survivors, uh, families to the uh, victims, and we have visited the sites according um, to the type of the uh, violation. And we, are tr we have tried to, to we, we, we see if there is a military target and uh, we collect all the uh, types of information that help us to build a strong case regarding the information. Uh, so, and then we publish. So we publish uh, reports, uh, statements. We have done documentary films. So it's, it's to raise the voices of victims, but to raise it in also in a way uh, that provides the details and to help um, whoever the target is to know the whole details around 
the incidents and um, to know more about the victims and also to more to know more about uh, the violator uh, itself. So if we say that there are airstrikes by the Saudi Emirati led coalition, landmines by Houthis, uh, a lot of cases of detention and torture by the Yemeni government and Houthis and uh, the United Arab Emirates and all the types of, of information, if we just say it in general, though it's going to be dealt as if it is not happening, unless we have documented it in details. So it's a, it's a way that helps us to work in these uh, violations as a fact and to push towards um, uh, not only to protect civilians and to minimize the harm, but also for accountability mechanisms in the future. And we know as a local NGO that even if we are documenting and doing our best, it will not be enough. We need international uh, mechanisms and international independent investigation to be happened in, in Yemen. It will make a very different influence. That's incredible. I remember prior to the establishment of the group of eminent experts, how hard it was to get any movement on the creation of an independent international mechanism in either Geneva or New York. I know that you've taken the findings of your documentation work and personally briefed the UN Security Council, US Congress, the EU, and other policymakers. What are some of the most consequential findings you've been able to share with governments? And how do you think it has changed the narrative around Yemen? So uh, at the beginning of the war, the narrative of the war was controlled by parties to the conflict and uh, their uh, uh, and their followers. Uh, the the independent human rights voice was was not there. I mean, even uh, internationally. So we have tried uh, as Muatana with all our partners to change the narrative. Uh, of the war from a human rights angle and to show the human price of the war and to, to, to show that there are no clean hands in Yemen when it comes to parties to the conflict. They are all committing horrible violations and, and it is committed, uh, it is uh, uh, documented and they are all equal when it comes to not respecting the international humanitarian law, the international law for human rights. When we talk about the types of uh, violations that are happening in Yemen, like the main types of violations, like the airstrikes by the Saudi Emirati coalition, uh, the ground chilling by different parties to the conflict, but mainly by Houthis, the landmines by Houthis, the uh, detention, uh, forced disappearance and torture happening by all parties to the conflict, and um, um, attacking hospitals and schools by all parties to the conflict and you mentioned very uh, perfectly the different parties to the uh, uh, of conflict at the beginning of this uh, interview um, so we in Muatana started to talk about starvation as a violation and we have been saying that uh, Yemenis are not just starving they are being starved and what's happening in Yemen, it's known as the human, it's the worst humanitarian crisis. But we have to remember that is a man-made crisis. So but the attitude of parties to the conflict led to this crisis. It's not a natural crisis. And the humanitarian aid, it's not the only solution uh, for this crisis. There should be accountability and should there should be pressure on parties to the conflict if we want to end this crisis. And there should be uh, for sure peace and um, we started to talk about the starvation as a violation because parties to the conflict are using starvation as a weapon of war and this shed the light on the crisis in Yemen and helped um, Yemen to be seen through a different angle which is the human rights angle the humanitarian angle and to encourage different states in order to act differently when it comes to Yemen. Given the waning attention on Yemen from those outside the country, how are you hoping the international community will respond to these findings? Uh, so it's uh, a key word like it's pressure, but when we say international community, uh, we mean mainly the states, 
because honestly, um, civil society and also media, they have done a lot of work to shed light on in, uh, in the situation in Yemen. Uh, but uh, so all the information that is needed for the states to act are already there. Uh, so states, especially states like the US, UK, and France, and also Arabian, uh, other Arabian states, they should be more engaged in the war in Yemen. Uh, they should uh, practice pressure on parties to the conflict in order to stop uh, their violations and to go forward uh, sustainable peace. And those who have who are uh, who are having uh, who are supporting actually some parties to the conflict should stop. And I'm I'm glad that there is a, a new. Uh, approach with the new U.S. administration, and I think this can um, have a big influence positively. Since the um, uh, the new the new approach of the new U.S. administration has started, um, the civilian impact of the airstrikes by the Saudi and Emirati-led coalition is very less, although. There is very different uh, hotlines now and front lines. There is a war still going on, but in spite of this, um, the the, in, the airstrikes where civilians are killed and injured are much much less. So this is good in a one hand, but it is also sad in another hand because it means that this could happen since the beginning of the war. Why we have lost thousands of civilians? because of the airstrikes, why they could do it in a way that uh, prevent or protect civilians. We, uh, with our partners, uh, set like a, a list of demands. We call it a list of urgent actions that can make the situation in Yemen much better, even among the war. And we have been saying that even among the war, Yemen doesn't have to be the worst humanitarian crisis. Uh, if there is accountability and if we, we succeed to make parties to the conflict care and if we solved like uh, little issues, it's little, but it's very huge. It's impact very huge, like the salaries. So thousands of Yemenis are not receiving their salaries since 2016. A big part of the Yemenis in the, in the public sector. And this one of the things that really broke in the back of Yemenis. And it can be solved, like Sana'a Airport and the land, sea, and uh, uh, and airports should be opened. The detainees should be released. Um, there are many. Um, um, there is a siege around one of the cities by Houthis and Ta'is. It can be uh, ended, and it will make a huge impact on civilians in in this area, for example. So there are many details that can be solved in, or, in order to make the situation uh, less miserable. I think that the civil society locally and internationally has succeeded to change the narrative of the war in Yemen, to put, uh, to make clear to the international community what should be done in order to make the situation less miserable and to shed light on the violations by all parties to the conflict and um, uh, to make clear that the only solution, the only real solution to the war in Yemen is peace and accountability. Absolutely. We've seen how the lack of accountability and impunity for attacks on civilians and other crimes has helped prolong this crisis. I think you've captured something really important to the essence of accountability in that it's not just important after the conflict has ended and you're attempting to hold individuals criminally accountable in courts. It's also essential while the conflict is ongoing. Uh, you just noted that the renewed pressure on the coalition by the Biden administration has been associated with a reduction in airstrikes. And this sort of pressure and accountability is a perfect example of how within a conflict you can provoke a different type of action by showing perpetrators that they can't get away with doing everything without consequences in the future. Right. And if there is um, a real accountability, it will have its impact even in non-state actors like Houthis. Exactly. 
Yemen became the worst humanitarian crisis. One main reason is the huge lack of accountability. Parties to the conflict, they trust impunity more than anything else. And I have been saying that in in most of the violations that we have documented in Muatana by different parties to the conflict, there was no even a military target or a military advantage. Um, so it, it's very preventable violations. But it's happening because parties to the conflict, they really don't care. I think one of the really valuable things that you mentioned at the beginning about the work of your organization is the voice of victims. Since you have such a large field presence, you really get the essence of who is affected by the conflict. It's not just a vacant set of numbers of millions of people suffering. Uh, They have faces, they have stories. So based on your experience over the past few years, what is your hope for justice for the people of Yemen? We used to have in Yemen a shape of state. We used to have uh, not a real democracy, but it was like one step towards democracy. So we have political parties, we have elections, we have different media, we have civil society. And all of this has been collapsed because of the the recent war. And Yemen now is controlled by armed groups and the space of civil society is shrinking and this is very dangerous. Uh, But in spite of all of this, Yemeni people, most of them are still civilians and they believe uh, on the rule of law. This is what they want for the f- for their future. They want a state that is based on democracy and the rule of law because Yemenis, they have experienced the different shape of ruling and they have also experienced what could, they know what could rule of law and democracy uh, do and how it could change their lives. Uh, so I want um, for the future of Yemenis, we want accountability for sure, but we want also to reach um, a peace process and a peace agreement that helps Yemenis to to have their lives back, to have their uh, dreams of having a state that is based on rule and de- uh, based on the rule of law and democracy back. This is the only shape of life that all societies in the world deserve. And Yemenis, they, 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 they not, not only they deserve this, they want this. Uh, you know, when we go to, um, uh, to document, when we, reach, when we reach, I mean, victims or their families, in order to document their stories, we tell them clearly that we are a human rights NGO that doesn't not, does not provide any humanitarian aid and we do not provide services our work is uh, uh, is to push uh, for justice and for accountability and in spite of this people are still very excited to tell us their stories they want to be told and they they believe in uh, in justice they want it uh, and uh, so I hope that you know accountability sometimes, states they they try to put the dilemma dilemma that accountability will 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 not help help peace but the fact that accountability it can push for peace and then it can maintain peace and also if it happened that the war came again for any reason at least the war will not be that aggressive if parties to the conflict knew that there will be accountability and I keep think, saying, if we as a local NGO in a very difficult uh, situation can have an impact, then how can um, we can imagine how much the impact is going to be if it is uh, happening internationally by states, for example. Uh, so it, there is in Yemen a space to influence, to impact, to change. And I hope that the international community, especially states, will take the chance uh, of this fact and make a real change in Yemen. As I said, the m- m- most of the violations in Yemen are very preventable, but also this war is very preventable and it can be solved. And I hope that our work will help uh, to push for that. Thank you, Radia. This has been a really energizing discussion on the power of local civil society 
in not just documenting what is happening in the country, but raising the profile and awareness of crimes against populations and putting the pressure forward to get a better response from the international community. Uh, in that regard, allow me to extend the Global Center's heartfelt congratulations to you for Mwatna's Nobel Peace Prize nom nomination. We look forward to following your progress through this process. And thank you again for sharing your time with us today. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Expert Voices on Atrocity Prevention. If you'd like more information about the Global Center's work on R2P, mass atrocity prevention, or populations at risk of mass atrocities, visit our website at globalr2p.org and connect with us on Twitter and Facebook at GCR2P.